Oops. Okay, is that working now? Right. Okay, I think we may have had a problem with the audio there, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to do that again. Um, can hear now. Good. Okay, right. Can everyone else hear now? Perfect. All right, let's let's start that again, shall we? Hello, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 7th of August in this non-farm payrolls webinar um, for July. Um, first and foremost, have a quick risk warning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Hewson. Um, I'm Chief Market Analyst in the UK. Um, been working in financial markets for the best part of 30 years, either trading. Um, I used to trade foreign exchange, um, specifically currencies, dollar yen, cable, that sort of thing. Did, did a small stint on the um, forward Aussie desk as well at Commonwealth Bank of Australia as well. And my, my method of, or my approach to markets is pretty much technical analysis. So um, generally to every decision I make in terms of where markets are likely to go, how where they're likely to trend and how they're likely to move is based very much on a technical based approach. Risk management is pretty much at the core of everything that I do when it comes to markets. So without further ado, um, let's 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 get cracking because I think one of the things about payrolls numbers is they generally tend to introduce an awful lot of short-term volatility, but they don't generally tend to move the market substantially um, one way or the other on a long-term basis. Um, and the key thing here, I think, is the expectations around this number are so varied and so wide that I don't think it really matters how good or bad the number actually is because the consensus the consensus estimates are anything from minus 600,000 to plus 5 million. Well, against that sort of consensus, you could argue that the data is already lagging. This week we saw the ADP payrolls report come in at 167,000, which was well below market expectations of 1.5 million. That being said, there was an upward revision of 2 million to the June number, which went up from 2 to 4 million. So the problem we've got with the data at the moment is because of the nature of this once in a lifetime pandemic, it fluctuates so wildly that it doesn't really tell us an awful lot about where any economy, and particularly the US economy, is now. We've seen a very big sell off in February, March, we saw 20.7 million jobs lost in the April payrolls. Since then, we've added back around about seven and a half million. That's if you don't include um, the ADP payrolls report, which generally can tend to track non-farms, but sometimes doesn't particularly well. For example, the non-farm payrolls report for last month came in at 4.8 million whereas the ADP payrolls report only came in at two. The last, the, the most recent adjustment to that saw that adjusted up in line with the non-farm payrolls number. And that's the big problem. It's the collection and collation of the data that's causing the problems. And I think in that context, that's why it's very, very important that we look at the weekly jobless claims numbers, because I think they tell us more than anything else about what the US economy is doing. And at the end of last week, we saw a big sell-off um, towards the end of March, last week, particularly when it came to um, European markets. US markets have continued to move higher, largely driven by the NASDAQ. We can see that here in this market. And when you're looking at a trend like that, I will always insist to you, it's very dangerous to try and pick the top. Never try and pick the top in an uptrend. Whenever you're trying to trade a trend, always buy the dips, so buy weakness. So look for entry points. And the way I time entry points is quite simple. It's basically by drawing a line through the lows, like so, and then looking for pullbacks towards that line and getting those pullbacks, buying the dip, placing the stop loss below the trend line itself, far enough away so that there are little pushes through, but you actually don't get a breakthrough. So it's basically about keeping those very those risk of your losses small 
while also riding the move higher. And that's ultimately all there is to it, really, if you think about it. Now, with respect to the NASDAQ here, there's an interesting chart here. There's an interesting set of two peaks here. I'm going to draw a horizontal line across the top here. I will get to the numbers in a minute, so don't worry. You're not going to miss anything. Now I've drawn this horizontal line across the top. Resistance, resistance, resistance. We've broken higher. We've come back higher, but we've held above the previous high. So that previous resistance has now become support. And this happens an awful lot when you're trading financial markets, whether it be currencies, whether it be gold, whether it be um, other commodities or indices or shares. Support and resistance can reverse their roles. And once a resistance breaks, it triggers stop losses. When you get a retest, it acts as support and then goes back up again. Um, and it's those sorts of opportunities that I try and look for when I'm trying to pick entry and exit points into markets. As another example through here, you got a pullback there, a low, a high, come back and tested it, it's held, and then it's gone higher again. This is a daily chart. Okay, so obviously we're looking at that on a fairly longer term time frame, but the principles are broadly similar. You're looking for areas of support or resistance to time your entry and exit points into and out of the trade. And that's essentially what I look for on any given market. I wait for the market to come to a level that I'm comfortable trading rather than chasing the market to try and make a profit or a loss. Because experience has taught me that you will make a loss on trades. That is a given. You have to reconcile yourself with that right now. Not every trade that you make will be profitable. The key is that when you lose money, you minimize those losses while at the same time, when you do make money, maximizing your profits. And in that context, that's why your entry and exit points are very, very important. Um, so that you keep your losses small, but you run your profits to a greater or lesser extent. So let's look at the numbers because we've seen a consolidated period of dollar weakness over the course of the last seven weeks. And I think a large part of the reason for that dollar weakness has been concern about the US economic recovery, um, particularly um, particularly last week when we saw that little modest jump higher in the claims numbers. And given that the US is the world's largest economy, um, that did spook financial markets. And we can see that in these two daily candles that we saw in the DAX. Thursday, Friday, big sell-off. And then Monday, a nice rebound. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, this is today. So today, over the course of the past week, trading has been fairly subdued. Good resistance at 12,800 coincides with those series of lows through there and there and the highs through here here and here. So we know this week that 12,800 is a fairly decent resistance level for the DAX. If we move up there, it stands to reason that we could see a little bit of selling interest um, start to drift in to the market. It's unlikely that people will take on new positions ahead of a weekend simply because of any geopolitical announcements, geopolitical risk. President Trump deciding to be a little bit controversial with some new executive orders or what have you. Running a position over a weekend is risky. I used to do it 10 or 20 years ago. Unfortunately, the risk reward now um, is not really in my favor. So I prefer not to do it. Um, so certainly in that context here, we also potentially got the beginnings of a potential head and shoulders as well, because those peaks here, and we haven't got back above those peaks here, and we've got a little bit of a head there. So a little bit of sideways consolidation at the moment. I think that will continue to be the case for equity markets more broadly. I think we're in a sideways range. We've been in the sideways range for quite some time now. Volatility is also lower in the summer, or ranges tend to be lower in the summer as well. Most of Europe goes on holiday. Um, and as such, you'll find that uh, trading volumes can thin up as well. So you know, when, when trading volumes do tend to diminish a little bit, um, you may find uh, that um, so do the ranges as well. And we're certainly seeing that with respect to the DAX. If we look at the UK 100 or the FTSE 100 as we know it, again, it's a similar sort of thing. Big, big top and in around 6,300. We did have a little flirt below 5,900. Didn't really consolidate that move. The FTSE 100 has underperformed significantly 
over the course of the past couple of weeks, largely because of the um, bank earnings and the large provisions that were set aside by UK banks for bad debts or non-performing loans. They've not been unique in that, if I'm honest. European banks, US banks, it's a similar sort of picture. So, and I think that is the concern going forward as we look ahead towards August, September and October. It's these concerns about rebound in the labour market, rising infection rates, um, basically hampering any economic rebound that we're likely to see in the third quarter of this year. We've already seen Spain, Germany, Italy and France post eye-watering declines in GDP. We're going to see the UK announce its latest numbers next week. So against that context, you know, we need to look at the key levels of support and resistance based on that. And at the moment, we're at the, sort of the lower end of the recent range on the FTSE. As far as the dollar is concerned, I think there's potential for a little bit of a rebound after the declines that we've seen over the course of the past few weeks. If we look at cable, we can see here big, big area of resistance all the way through 132. So it's going to take something substantively weak to push cable through 132. Um, looking at this candle here, or this candle formation here, there does appear to be fairly decent demand anywhere near 130, as evidenced by those very long shadows on these daily candles. But the failure to go through 132 yesterday could see a little bit of dollar strength and sterling weakness in the wake of today's payrolls numbers. It's a similar sort of story for euro dollar as well. Um, running into a little bit of resistance above 119, we could see a move lower, stronger dollar again, euro weaker over the course of the past um, few days, simply because we've declined seven weeks in a row in the dollar. And it's unlikely that um, that will be sustained in the short to medium term. Another part of dollar weakness has been the move in the gold price. Seeing a little bit of a pullback now, seeing a little bit of dollar strength today, that could go, that could well be maintained going into the weekend as well. So I think the biggest risk at the moment is that you could get a bad number, the dollar could weaken, but then it could come and bounce back in the way of profit taking. Looking at the numbers, 1.65 million overall, you know, it could come in higher than that, it could come in lower than that. The biggest problem I have with these numbers is they are subject to revision. And this non-farm payrolls numbers only includes July up to the 14th of July. So what it won't do is it won't include the numbers in the last two weeks of July where you could where we've seen these lockdowns reintroduced across the Sun Belt states of the US, namely Florida, Arizona, Texas, and California. So a good number here, while positive, may mask the effects of layoffs in the latter part of July. And let's not let's not also forget that at the end of July, the unemployment enhanced payouts of $600 a week expired, which could prompt a spike in weekly jobless claims next week after the really good numbers that we saw yesterday. So this gives you an indication of how quickly the data can change in the space of a week. Fiscal stimulus, there is an expectation we could see some. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. President Trump has suggested an executive order. Well, that may happen, that may not. As far as I'm concerned, I think what the market is looking for today is a strong number in, a, in the region of around 2 million. That could prompt a little bit of dollar buying, um, could prompt euro dollar to potentially go back to around about 118.70. But I would be surprised if we see further dollar weakness over and above what we've already seen this week, um, which brings me nicely onto dollar yen. Seen a little bit of a rebound there. Before I forget, we've also got the Canadian jobs report. Um, looking at dollar CAD here, we're approaching a very, very key trend line support area around about um, the 130s. But given what we've seen here, the likelihood is we're probably going to edge back, edge back towards 134 um, in the event of a decent Canadian or, or a poor Canadian jobs report. And the problem with having both job reports on the same day is that usually the dollar number, the US dollar number, will, out, will outweigh the Canadian dollar number. So let's look at Euro dollar on a very short term basis chart and see what sort of price movements we get at the moment. 
getting a little bit of dollar weakness heading into the numbers. Let's see whether or not the actual numbers continue that overall trend and get a retest of the highs at 118.50. So I'll now be quiet and wait for the numbers to break. Okay, decent, pretty much in line. Revision 4.79 million. Um, average earnings have edged higher, 4.8%. Not really interested in that. Fairly decent uh, Canadian payrolls number. Unemployment rate in the US has dropped back to 10.2%. Um, so, yeah, I mean, broadly positive. You're seeing a big positive dollar move there um, to retest the lows of around about 118.10. Um, that could just be a counter move before a squeeze higher. Normally, the first move is the wrong move, in my experience. So getting a little bit of buying interest around about 118, 118.10 on the euro dollar. There's a there's a there's a bit of a support level around about 117.80 as well. So you need to be aware of that. I'll just change that to an hourly chart so we can see that there. And on, on the hourly chart, you can see the picture looks fundamentally different. So you can see here there's a decent series of highs all the way through 119. We've gone for a little bit of a dip below uh, 118.30. Um, as I said, I think in terms of these numbers, you may see a squeeze back to 118.50, but I would be minded to probably move a little bit lower towards 117.5 over the course of the next few hours. Of course, um, you know that could come back and bite me, but at the end of the day, my feeling is that by and large, the unemployment rate is a fairly decent number. And the markets are probably going to take that as a broadly positive in US dollar terms. In terms of the actual markets themselves, it's not really giving us too much of a steer one way or the other. Let me just quickly look at that. Broadly market positive. But then I think a bad number would have been broadly market positive. Uh, the way these markets have been over the course of the past uh, past few years. Let's see what it's doing to gold. I would expect it to push the downward pressure on gold, that number, going forward. Let's just dig into the overall numbers. The unemployment rate's come down, but the more important number is the underemployment rate, which was 18%, and that's dropped to 16.5%. So on the face of it, fairly decent number. Um, the participation rates dropped also ever so slightly from 61.5 to 61.4, um, but certainly not enough to suggest that um, the drop in the underemployment rate has been as a result of people dropping out of the workforce. It's actually been as a result of people returning to the workforce. So all in all, those numbers are fairly dollar positive, and I would suggest that you'll probably see a little bit of dollar strength as we head into the uh, as we head into the end of the day. Um, but but overall, um, pretty nothing set of numbers, pretty much in line with expectations. Um, just been asked, why do I feel that cable is so strong? Well, cable is only strong against the, the pound is only strong against the dollar. If you actually look at the way that it's performed against other currencies, you can actually see that it has significantly underperformed. And I can show you a good example of how to identify that if we just do a quick comparison on a Bloomberg chart. So this is the pound over the course of the last five days. Um, sterling performance against G10. So it's done very well against the Swiss franc and done very well and flat against the dollar, but it's performed poorly pretty much against everything else. We now go and do that over a month. It's much more of a mixed bag, but you can see it's done very, very well against the dollar. Not so, but not so much against the euro. In fact, against the euro, it's fallen back. So I think a large part of the sterling strength that you've seen over the course of the past month or so has been largely down to the fact that the dollar has been so weak, and the pound has been a key benefit beneficiary from that. Um, so. Um, Whenever people talk about sterling strength, it's always important to remember it's not just about um, sterling against the dollar. There are another, there's a host of other currencies that um, 
it um, has underperformed against, and the euro has been has been a, has been a key one of them. And I think the perception there with respect to the euro is that there's been an awful lot of bearish sentiment around that, and there is an expectation that European leaders may come to some form of unified position over the course of the pandemic recovery program. And whether or not you believe that's credible or not is neither here nor there. The market seems to think that it is. And that's why the euro has gone quite a bit higher over the course of the past month or so. So that's the world currency ranker. So if we if we look at that, um, as I say, against um, against the dollar now, we can get a much better indication of how the dollar has performed over the past month. And as you can see, um, the pound is sort of midway between all of them. So the dollar's lost ground against pretty against everything over the past one month. We go for the last five days. Similar sort of story apart from the Swiss franc and the British pound, where it's actually done quite well. So always bear that in mind when you're looking at the pound. Sometimes it can just be a pure dollar story and to all intents and purposes it pretty much has been um any other questions ladies and gents please feel free to fire them over that's what i'm here for uh, da, 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 da. okay well in, in the absence of um any other questions i'm going to basically go through some technical analysis in terms of euro yen um, and other euro crosses one of the, another reason why I think the euro is likely to be fairly um, toppy has been the fact that euro yen is looking as if it might be on the cusp of a significant reversal. What we've got here, and I've highlighted it with a green oval, is the potential for a classic reversal pattern on candlesticks. So we look at candlestick pattern here. There's potential for a potential evening star reversal, which is a combination of three candles. What it does do, though, it requires confirmation. So if Euro Yen is going to break lower, what we need to see over the course of the next two or three days is for the low on this candle here, which is indicated by 124.60, which is in the top left hand corner here. If you can see, there's a counter in the top left hand corner. So if I point the cursor at that, we can see that. The low is 124.60. So if we break below 124.60, that low, there's a good chance that we could start to roll over and head down back towards 124 and 123. Because one of the one of the key arbiters of this move higher in euro yen has been obviously the euro dollar rising sharply from the lows, running into that 50% retracement there. So there is a there is a chance that we could be a little bit toppy. And if we're toppy on euro yen, it stands to reason that we could be toppy on euro dollar as well. Um, so I'm keeping an eye on euro dollar and euro yen in the context of a policy now that I have of looking to sell euro on strength. So any 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 euro rally into 118 118.50 towards the previous highs, looking to get short with a stop loss above 119. Um, you know, for a move back to around about 117, 116 and a half. May or may not work, but at the end of the day, it's that sort of risk management that you've got to think in terms of. If you're going to risk 50 to 100 points on the upside, then you should be looking to make at least double that on the other side of the trade. So not only think about your stop loss, but also think about your take profit as well. Um, question: Why is the Swissy so weak? Um, well, the, the Swiss franc itself has actually been quite strong. Um, the dollar has been weak against the Swiss franc. Is that what you mean? Or you know, do you mean why has the Swissy been so strong and the dollar been so weak against the Swissy? I just want to clarify before I answer that question. I'll come to the yen in a minute until I get a response. And I'll come to the yen. I'll do the yen now. Um, dollar yen has been falling largely as a result of a little bit of risk off. When we saw the big sell-off in equity markets yesterday, generally the yen tends to act as a haven trade. So 
we get by um people buy yen when they sell um equities in general so if we look at the nikkei 225 they generally tend to track each other when dollar yen goes down the nikkei goes down when dollar yen goes up the nikkei generally tends to go up your, your japanese yen tends to be your general safe haven trade in the same way that the swiss franc has been so let's look at the swiss franc over the course of the past 30 I mean generally if equity markets are going up the Swiss franc the Swiss franc tends to be weak it's a generally it's, it's your general risk off risk on so the Swiss franc tends to act as a haven currency in the same way that the yen does. So if you have weakness in equity markets, then generally the Swiss franc is strong. If the equity markets are looking fairly well supported, then the Swiss franc will remain weak. Um, does that help? I mean, that's your general risk on risk off explanation for Swiss strength, yen strength, yen weakness, gold and what have you. They tend to be viewed as haven trades more than anything else um the dollar is i mean the thing is dollar yen is one of those currencies it's very difficult to trade because it, it will trade sideways for an awful long time and then it'll explode very sharply to the upside or the downside you know we saw that here we've seen a very slow move lower we've seen a gradual move back and dollar yen is like watching paint dry i know i should know i used to trade it um what i would say is that if you get a move back to rules around about 106.20 if we look at this series of lows through here and there and the highs through there 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 would appear to be fairly decent selling interest there so on that basis we'll probably see a little bit of yen weakness dollar strength back towards these peaks here before we start to turn lower again i still think there's an awful lot of risk which is not being priced into the market at the moment, which the yen could well benefit from, and the dollar, as a result, could see a little bit of weakness. So for the moment, and we can see from the dollar yen here, it trades very, very quietly for long periods of time, then you get these explosive moves up and down. Pretty much a widow maker trade if you're the wrong side of it. And then it settles down, and then it trades fairly quietly again. The cloud the Ichimoku cloud moves together, usually acts as resistance on a move back. And then once it settles down again, it'll then start to move higher or lower. But at the moment, while it's below this cloud, Kumo cloud, the likelihood is that we're probably going to see sell the rally on dollar yen. Okay, what else have we got? Crude oil cash I'm being asked about. Crude oil has settled down quite a lot in recent weeks. I'm still of the opinion that we are on the cusp of a potential move higher. We've got convergence between the two moving averages. The gap has been filled. You're absolutely right. And the, and the 200 day moving average is there. I'm still of the opinion of selling the rally on Brent until such times as we break above and close above the 200 day moving average. Momentum is positive. The 50 day is starting to move higher. So you can look at the lows here and you can see that the lows are getting higher, the highs are getting higher. So from that point of view, I'm still very much a buy the dip in crude oil. Um, and that's no better borne out by this candle here. We saw a very sharp move to the downside. We didn't take out the July lows here. We closed well up on the lows of the day, which suggests that the market is still betting that oil prices are likely to move lower. And that suggests that it could get caught out on any further squeezes higher. 200 day moving average is a big deal, though. I think if we're able to move above the 200 day moving average, then we could see a very quick move towards $50. At the moment, I don't think the momentum is there to dictate that and ultimately i don't think the demand is there at the moment 
to dictate that. So it really depends on what OPEC Plus and OPEC do with respect to potential production cuts, whether or not they continue them into the winter months, uh, and whether or not you get a big demand drop off or whether demand picks up. An awful lot of how oil reacts will depend on how strong a rebound that we get into the second half of the year and whether or not we get a second wave of coronavirus cases as winter draws in in the northern hemisphere. And that's the big risk, I think, for oil prices. You don't want oil prices to break higher too quickly because you could kill demand anyway, particularly with the global economy remaining so weak. But what OPEC don't want to do is to see oil prices back, fall back below $40 a barrel either. So um, my view on the gold trade, I'm still buying the dip on gold. Um, I think you have to. I think while US yields remain as low as they are, the argument for gold or not being in gold is very, very weak. People have always said, and I and I posted an article on it earlier this week, and you can find it on the CMC Markets website in the news and analysis section under insights. Gold precious metal search. The main premise or the main criticism that people have said about owning gold is that it has no yield and it has no cash flow. Well, you could be describing an awful lot of government bonds in that particular description. And you could also be describing an awful lot of companies that are trading at elevated valuations that aren't making any money as well. So how is gold any different to Uber, Lyft or um, German Bunds or any other bond that actually trades at a negative yield. It isn't. So why would you not have some gold in your portfolio? Now that we've broken above the previous peaks at 1920, then for me, gold prices, I think, can continue to go higher. And really, the, the big question is where, you know, how, how, how much higher can they go? And um, to my mind, unless there's a big, big recovery in economic activity or a rebound in yields, then 2,100 is probably the next stop. Now, the big question is, where do you get in? Because I certainly wouldn't be getting in here. Um, certainly be looking for a dip maybe back to 2,000. If we do get a dip back to 1920, then again, certainly look at that because previous peaks generally tend to act as decent support levels on any pullbacks. But certainly, I think in terms of gold, um, for the time being, um, the only way is by the dips, I think, in, in terms of gold prices. Getting asked about silver. Yeah, I mean, silver, a lot of people got burnt um, quite a while ago in the big sell off from $50. I certainly think there's potential for silver to go an awful lot higher just based on the gold silver ratio. And again, I talk about the gold silver ratio in this article here. As I say, please read it. It's very useful in terms of looking, you know, at where we are with respect to the gold silver ratio. This is the gold silver ratio that I was talking about. Um, we've come back quite a long way. In terms of the gold silver ratio, we can come all the way back here, which means that silver will continue to outperform gold. Now, what that doesn't mean is that silver will continue to go up. It will just mean that if gold and silver sell off, silver won't sell off as fast as gold, and that will bring the gold-silver ratio down. That is a pure outperformance indicator. It doesn't measure how quickly silver will go up relative to gold or vice versa. So it's a ratio. And it's been way out of whack for the last 10 years. And now we're getting a bit of a corrective to that. Um, so there's certainly potential for more silver outperformance over the course of the next few weeks and months. And of course, if you don't want to play the gold-silver ratio, you can always play the precious metals index, which has a silver weighting of 41.25% relative to gold's 29.1%. So if you think silver is going to outperform gold on our CMC Markets Precious Metals Index, you can have a play around with that. Right, so um, brings us back to silver. $30 an ounce is probably going to be a bit of a barrier. So again, I wouldn't be getting overly aggressively 
um, long as silver at these sorts of levels. And when you look at where silver was on the 19th of March, it's doubled. So, um, sorry, Alan, I'll get to you. Sterling Aussie. I had a lot of questions. I do apologize, sir. So, Sterling Aussie, it's looking, it's looking a little bit toppy overall. But um, what this has told me here is it, we've probably seen a bit of a base um, or it's forming a little bit of a base. If I draw a horizontal line through these peaks here, there is certainly potential for an inverse head and shoulders starting to form on Sterling Aussie. However, we're not going to really know how that's going to play out until such times as we get a pullback. And as long as we don't break below 180, then I think there's a good chance that the bottom is in for Sterling Aussie and we can see Sterling Aussie head back towards 190. So be a bit of short term weakness on the Sterling Aussie, may find a few bids around about 180. Um, but I would certainly look for a look to, to buy Sterling Aussie on a dip back towards 180 with a stop loss around about 179 and a half there or thereabouts based on that particular piece of price action there. But obviously you have to be prepared that if you do break below 179.50, you get out and then have, a, have another look at something else. But certainly looking for a bit of a buy the dip trade on Sterling Aussie. Um, but, 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 but let's see what else have I got. Any other questions? Have I forgotten anyone? Because I'm just looking through um, most of it. Yeah, gold is gold is massively overbought. Doesn't mean the trend can't continue. Um, the S&P remained overbought in 2015 for two years and continue and still continued to go higher. So it's not about being overbought or oversold because depending on the indicator, the value of the indicator you use, the degree of overboughtness can vary. So this is this gives you a decent let's let's look at the let's look at a couple of different indicators. What I generally tend to use on gold is a slow stochastic. Now that is a smoothed indicator. Now you can see it's been overbought since 1700. So all the way up here. Um, David, I'll come to your question on Sky News in a minute. So don't let me forget it and I'll, I'll talk to you about it. Um, so we can remain overbought for a very, very long time. So what we can do here, if we use another indicator, let's use an RSI, for example, okay, and change the value to say 13. Suddenly it becomes a little bit less overbought. Now let's make it 21. And even less overbought, but it's been it's starting to get overbought here on an RSI using a different value to the 10 that I've used over here. So on this RSI, it's not overbought. On this slow stochastic, it is overbought. So you have to be very, very careful about what you do consider overbought and oversold because it really does depend on the oscillator that you're using underneath your chart. So the question I would ask you is um, what indicator are you using that's saying that gold is massively overbought? And maybe you need to consider maybe tweaking it so that you can get an idea of perspective when it comes to what is overbought and what is oversold. Um, in terms of my interview on Sky News, um, it was on BP. I was talking about BP on Sky News. I was talking to the BBC on Monday about HSBC. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, did you have a question on BP, David, or, or banks in general? Or was it just, just curiosity or anything like that? See, I think this is the thing when, when you use, going back to what I was saying about gold and indicators, the oscillator that you use on the bottom of your chart will basically vary significantly depending on the value that you use. So if you're looking at a daily chart, 
then I would argue that looking at the last 10 days is probably a good compromise. And the reason for that is that generally when you get a very sharp move higher, it, it won't generally last for more than 10 days. Now, obviously, there will be extremes like this move in gold prices. Um, but by and large, if you have an indicator underneath your graph of an oscillator, slow stochastic, a MACD, an RSI, and it's overbought, but the trend is higher, ignore the oscillator because an oscillator is very much a secondary indicator. You break down markets and charts in, I, I break down markets and charts into two categories, primary indicators and secondary indicators. Oscillators are very much secondary indicators. They need to confirm what my primary indicator is telling me. If my primary indicator is telling me the trend is up and trend an uptrend is higher lows and higher highs, and it's overbought, I discard or ignore what the oscillator is telling me. Because until such times as one of those previous lows on the uptrend gets taken out, then the trend is assumed to be in place until you have significant evidence that it is reversed. So for me, it's always about the trend. It's always about the price. The oscillators should help you in terms of timing and entry and exit point into the underlying trend. Do not use an oscillator to go short into an uptrend or a downtrend. Use it to take profit if you want to, but do not, whatever you do, use an oscillator to sell into an uptrend or go short into an uptrend or buy or buy in, you know, or, or do the opposite in a downtrend because you could end up underwater very, very quickly. Any oscillators need to confirm what your primary indicators are telling you. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, okay, so about Sky News and BP. Yeah, I mean, the reason BP did as well as it did in the wake of the dividend cut was because it was largely expected. Let's have a look at BP because. I was talking to Sky about it earlier um, this week. And there's your up move. Of course, since then, we've come back down again. Um, I mean, BP's been paying a dividend that it can't afford for quite some time now. Um, it's got debt levels of over and above almost $50 billion. It has brought them down to $40 billion. It's gearing is well over 30%. Um, and it's struggling to make any money and it's just taken 15 to 20 billion dollars of write downs in terms of its over future, overall future output. Despite the dividend cut for BP, it's still got a 5% dividend yield even after the dividend cut. So when you look at BP relative to, say, for example, other companies, um, had a 10% dividend yield before, it's got a 5% dividend yield now. So assuming that it can hold on to roughly where it is now, then it should, as long as it stays above um, the lows in March, you, sh you should still be able to get a 5% return, which in a, in a world of low or negative interest rates isn't too shabby. So really then the only decision you have to make, David, is whether you think the bottom is in for BP and whether or not it's worth buying some BP shares for the 5% dividend yield that you're going to get. And that was essentially what I was on um, TV to talk about with respect to BP. Um, is the worst behind them? If it is, you know, it's um, it really depends on whether or not you think that the, that the bottom is in for BP. Um, now, I'm being asked a rather naughty question by an Irish friend of mine about um, BT, not BP, BT. Um, I don't know whether you've read my note on BT, but um, the lows that we saw in 2008, 2009, around about 78, 80p, um, it's working in a very competitive 
space it's going to have to pay um, out an awful lot in terms of 5g and high fiber super fiber broadband and the big question i have about bt um, even without the dividend questions is whether or not they can afford it now there was speculation last weekend that open reach was on the table in terms of um, being sold personally i think if they sell open reach they'd be making a big mistake because it's about the only part of their business that is actually worth anything so um, you may find that they might sell a stake in it which could help bolster their finances but um, overall um, it's for me i think there's too many uncertainties around it at the moment certainly seems to be good support in and around these lows here um if i just get rid of this level here we can see that every time it's dropped down to um 94 95p it's come back the thing that worries me is that every rebound that we've seen since then has been fairly shallow which makes me think that we may have another crack at the downside and these lows that we saw all the way back in March 2009 when it bottomed out around about 78p. But I can't imagine that the British government would allow BT to go bust. So um, on that basis, they might be worth a punt, but I certainly wouldn't recommend you buy them. <laughs> Hope that helps. <laughs> Yeah, um, with respect to CMC market share price movement, I can't really help you there because we don't have it on the platform. So <laughs> I'm sorry about that, sir. I can't advise you on that. Any other, have I forgotten anybody? Just quickly going through stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up, but first and foremost, before I go, um, the key items to keep a close eye out for next week, the UK second quarter GDP, which is due out on the 12th. So that could that could weaken the pound in the short to medium term. Um, expecting a, a number in the region of between minus 15 and minus 20. Um, um, we've also got July jobless claims. I think they're gonna be more important than the UK ILO unemployment numbers um because they're still around about 3.9 or 4 percent when the actual real unemployment number is far higher than that the fact that people are on furlough is keeping the official ILO unemployment numbers artificially low so keep an eye on the jobless claims numbers they were at 7.3 percent they're due out on tuesday also to get a better idea of what the uk jobs picture looks like you need to compare the number of people on the payroll before march and the number that's on the payroll now. Now in June, that was 660,000 lower than March. So I will be looking to see whether or not July brought an improvement on that number or a deterioration in that number. We've also got US retail sales on Friday. Um, seen a decent rebound in consumer spending. I think July might struggle because of what's happened in the Sun Belt states, the fall in consumer confidence, and that we saw in July as well. We could see US consumers start to adopt a safety first approach when it comes to consumer spending. So those could disappoint. Obviously, the weekly jobless claims that we've got due out on the Thursday. Um, will we get a spike in claims now that the unemployment um, enhanced benefit of $600 a week has rolled off? And then we've got Chinese retail sales and industrial productions also out on the 14th of August. So keep an eye on those numbers. So those are the key macro announcements that I got my eye out for um, over the course of the next few weeks. The next few weeks, next few days, what am I talking about? Anyway, on that note, ladies and gents, I'd like to thank you all very much for your company this afternoon. Thank you for all the questions. I hope you found it useful. Um, more than happy to answer any questions via email or what have you. Um, if you want to answer them, 
if you could um, leave some feedback on the webinar, I would be very, very grateful. You'll be receiving an email from myself over the course of the next 24 hours. And if you've got any suggestions on how we can improve it, um, they would be gratefully received as well. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you all for listening and um, have a great weekend. Thanks very much. Cheers, guys.